So that's like a concise um, uh, version of the huge and ambitious piece that you did first at the Barbican and then you reproduced it at the Whitney. Um, but that was much more complex because it was working with different uh, games across time, across how many years of time? 20 years? That was maybe almost 30 years of games. Yeah, those were all bowling games uh, programmed to bowl gutter balls. And then that was kind of the big version. And then <coughs> I had made that chip and the idea that I could do this with any game, but somehow I got stuck on bowling for a couple of years because I thought it was the funniest. And so now I, for, I was just trying it out with different trying it out with different games to see, you know, and I, basketball I tried out for this. For no particular reason other than I, I thought, I don't know, it just came up. I think that uh, gives me the opportunity I wanted to quote your brilliant comment at the uh, Wired conference uh, that you did the other day. Wired had this big um, techno conference at St Pancras Hotel and Hansel Obris was interviewing you and he had brought uh, Corey together with a a games programmer who works and does Sims like things. The Sims Online. Sims Online. And uh, Corey eventually admitted that the things you guys do, said, referring to the, the gaming industry, I just want to bring them to their knees. And uh, that seemed very kind of funny, but also very revealing. There's this you know, obvious kind of inherent subversion. But I, I wondered, uh, taking it a bit seriously, did you say that from a. So it's a, it's a hacking uh, process. Did you want to use what they have and do something different with it? Hacking is usually associated with a kind of moral or political um, motivation. Is that in your work, or is it an aesthetic motivation entirely? Well, a couple of things. Um, I think I was trying to refer to like any tech, like all those people in the audience. These are the Wired magazine conference. Like, I I was referring to them more in a broad sense of like. Like, because those are there were some people there from like doing cloud computing, some people doing like social, uh, like different social network apps or whatever, mm -hmm. and um, and I think in particular I was talking about the idea of cloud computing and how fun it is that you have these unlimited resources now, and how it brings up all these great, you know. So for example, I don't know if any of you've seen these these ten hour YouTube videos this kid has been uploading. Have you seen this? Mm -hmm. It's, it's brilliant. So it'll, it'll be like one little loop, right? Or a couple loops and he'll stretch, he'll paste them over and over again into like a 10 hour video and then he'll upload them to YouTube. So you, you'll go on YouTube and you'll hit play and the video will just start going and you realize that it's gonna take 10 hours to play. And so to me that's like, that is an, uh, the ideal. Sort of maxing out the um, possibilities, the technological possibilities, taking them to the limit. Yeah, because that is actually a video on the server in some Google server farm, like taking up an enormous amount of hard drive space that actually doesn't have any content. You know what I mean? And that to me is like the, that. Literally, what this kid has done, I think, is like a high watermark of expression for right now. Do you know what I mean? Like, and so I was kind of trying to get with these people in the audience who were literally making these technologies that. Yes. It's fun that they're creating new stuff because then you could literally just do use it for the stupidest purposes. Do you know what I mean? That's exactly what it's not supposed to be, and it doesn't have to be hacking. And I think I think I think that there's two ways to def that people use the term hacking, and one is like yeah, like you know, breaking into banks or whatever. Yeah. But the other way is the original way that the term was used, which is like. Um, playing pranks, like doing clever stuff. And it doesn't necessarily even have to involve technology. Like uh, a hack is like doing something clever with some kind of existing system, you know what I mean? And, and I think you know, to upload a 10 hour YouTube video is a really great hack of the system because it's just ridiculous. And anyway, so that's, I would say that's what I hope or at least that's an inspiration, or that kind of situation is an inspiration with, you know, some of the work. And it is for his own sake, or, I mean, there is, like, among that crowd, you know, with great respect to their achievements and everything, there's a kind of piousness about what they're doing, that it's for the good of mankind, and how they're enabling kids to play responsibly, and all this sort of language, um, oh, with the language of money, so uh, you're puncturing that. Are you, are you trying to? You're trying to deflate the, the sort of pretensions of that world, or are you just having a good time? Um, 
definitely the work isn't, the work doesn't consciously involve that community or that no. world, right? Uh, I think my stuff engages the culture that arises out of the, the things that those people, you know, I guess it's weird to sit in this room because these works, you know, these works I think are kind of related, but, you know, so, let me think, like, like I have a, you know, like, of work that is just a, a search on Twitter for the for, for the phrase "working on my novel," right? And so you, it's a real time search, and when you when you click on the link, it's just you see anyone in the last day that's tweeted that they're working on their novel, and and so that's more of an example of a work that engages with the type of culture that emerges from these new kind of tools. Do you know what I mean? And so that's more. So it's drawing on it rather than subverting it. You're not trying to. It's drawing on it, and I'm not necessarily yeah. trying to subvert it, because I think the tools are too temporary to even get so involved in what they mean in specific. But you, it's, oh, I'm listening to myself talking. I'm getting all, never mind, let's just stop. Okay. <laughs> Maybe there's like another way to come at that. Like I'm, I'm, um, I'm interested in, in, like obviously in this, it's most obvious in this in the bowling piece, maybe, mm -hmm. but in this, um, uh, we, we can talk about this, we can get a bit naked here, we can talk about failure, right? Do we can it. Talk about, um, you know, this, this, this seems, um, that seems pretty fundamental, I mean that's the, you know, in a way, we, we can talk about the kind of technical aspect of the bowling games, that all these different games are hacked in different ways so that they gutter all the time, but, the, but um, uh, you know, the, there is fundamentally that this, it's kind of about failure, and, and, when, and, and the point, you know, there seems in, in a lot of your work, to me it seems anyway, there's this question um, of this reciprocity between failure and success, and that, that, that the moment when it becomes ambiguous, when, you know, when the, when the huge amount of effort it takes to achieve a failure, you know, does that, does that is there a kind of uh, Midas effect where that makes, that, that flips over into another form of achievement? Yeah, and I, yeah, definitely, I mean, and I know that my work but yeah, it's good you bring that up because it is easy for me to talk about the technical stuff, but in the end, the artwork really is that's literally not really part of any of this work. Do you know? Does that make sense? It's not the art moments aren't created because of the technical stuff, right? It's created because of that kind of what you're trying to say. Like, I'm going to skip ahead, but yeah, like I, all I know is that I, sometimes I just try to make a work that is so dumb, like that it'll try to it'll hopefully cross over, you know what I mean? Like something that is so base and so simple um, or takes, either takes a long time to achieve something ridiculous or no time to achieve something monumental, like was literally what I'm sitting in front of. I mean, this takes one click, you know? <laughs> this whole room, I mean, with the exception of the basketball, like those are just scan. I mean, everyone, you just hit a button and you scan, right? So like this room is, is like a five minutes, is five minutes, you know? And there's something to me that's funny about that. Like to create something like this using a computer in, two, in five minutes, you know what I mean? And, oh, and so, but anyway, what I'm trying to say is that I do know that, and I often get into a dangerous territory when, you, when you're trying to get this salt and pepper perfect of this dynamic, is that sometimes it just doesn't work and sometimes you're left with just something that's just not funny and it's terrible. Does that make sense? So I, so as, like, that's the biggest, when I'm making something, that is literally the, the hardest, the thing that I'm wrestling with most of all the time, to get the salt and pepper right, where something is so simple that it transcends into an actual valid moment for somebody. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And my life is just filled with stress about new ideas and whether or not. And sometimes you don't know until they're shown. Sometimes you don't even know when they're shown. Sometimes you only realize it years later that something didn't work. It's like, uh, oh, I'm getting, now I'm getting like weird in another way. I'm getting like really low self-esteem on you guys. <laughs> but but that's, the, that's the territory that I'm, that is literally the territory that I think almost all my work works in. These greater pieces are very particular group. There are others <coughs> where the whole spectrum, like on this piece, right. Is revealed and it, they're very lush and very beautiful. And this is very austere, really. You yeah. Know, you said it's a. I think I used the word dumb. Dumb, austere, <laughs> dumb, whatever. Yeah. No, no, I'm just joking now. Um, I don't know. When I when I knew I was going to do the show, the only thing that the first thing that popped in my head in the anchor of the show were these. I knew I wanted to do a series of these yellow prints mm -hmm. with the red stripes, and I, I. 
it was the kind of first thing I knew that it was the thing that was in the show first and the thing that I never questioned. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been slowly over the last couple of years looping through many of the default Photoshop gradients, you know, and making different works based on them. And, um, and for the show I did at the Whitney, I did a new set, and one of them that was in the new set was similar to this. It was yellow with a red stripe, and um, I don't know, it just seems so different than the other ones. And um, I really liked it at the Whitney, and so, and I and I wanted to, I wanted to make, sh you know, I wanted to make sure that these first two floors of the gallery were, uh, were kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, austere, simple, direct, and so I decided to just to make a whole series of just from one gradient. You know what I mean? And so that's what these, and that you know, one of the few things you could pick is like where the, you know, if I'm doing a horizontal line, where the line is, you know. I could have made the line vertical. There's a few things I could have done with this gradient. The, the line could have been wider. Um, but this, this is clicking in a, this is like clicking a little bit and then bringing it down and then letting go of your mouse. So it's like a very... So the reference to minimal painting is clear. Do you think you're making some of the same or similar aesthetic choices as Bonnet Newman? Oh, I don't know what... <laughs> yes. No, I mean, certainly it engages that history, right? And, mm -hmm. and what, and um, probably, I mean, but it doesn't involve paint. These are photographs, right? And so, I mean, it's hard to say what, you know, it's, it's really hard to say, I have to say, like, what, you know, it's my conscious side knows that I'm just on Photoshop for a couple minutes making them, and my intuitive side knows that um, I had never done anything like it, and it would be fun to try what it would be like just to have these massive yellow photographs. You know what I mean? And so, and then I, and then obviously I was like, well, I think it's only going to work if I put some golf clubs in front of it. You know, so then it kind of spirals out of control into this kind of like unwieldy situation, but. But that's kind of like where, how it came together, you know. Does, I didn't help you, I didn't help very much on that one. No, no, I think, I, it's, I mean, obviously in relation to the, what, the work in the front room as well, right. the kind of sol, solar wick connections, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it makes me think a bit, like this strain of your work, because I think there's definitely different sides to your work, but there are these sides, there's this side that's about, um, like, so taking an existing system mm -hmm. and making a very small decision that then yeah. plays out over it. And there's a really, I remember a really great interview with solar wick where he's saying, you know, people say that conceptual art is very rationalistic. Actually, you know, what's rationalistic is like an, an abstract expression's painting, because that's like a million decisions. Right. Like little flicks of, you know, they might think of it as intuitive, but there's actually a decision. There's a conscious decision that's right. gone into each fleck. All I do, I make one decision, which is what the system is, and it's going to do its own right. thing. And that seems to, in a way, that's very, that's the element of that history, which seems to relate to your practice to me. Yeah, absolutely. And my experience with that history wasn't necessarily through even Solowit. It was through, you know, Elvin Lussier, Steve Reich, it was through the minimal composers is where I first engaged and started making this type of algorithmic work, you know, where you set up the process and you just let it go. And, and, and I think I got to making things like this through composition, literally. I mean, um, you know, like, you know, my video Sweet 16, which is the beginning of the Guns N' Roses Sweet Child of Mine phasing. Like, I literally... It, it literally came through a composition, but um, yeah, it, and it's, I don't know, it's my kind of control freak side that, that literally wants to pare everything down to one tiny gesture, you know, where I can't, I couldn't possibly handle anything more. It would, it would be so complicated for me to conceptualize, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. Um, Is that what you refer to as high concept? Film, the, the yeah. Kind of single twist that makes that something work. Yeah, that's why I'm attracted to movies like that. Yeah, it's a single twist of a plot. Oh, the guy dies, and you know they still have to drag him around. That's like the plot. Or Brewster's Millions. You know, you have to you you inherit thirty. Can you spend thirty million dollars in a month? You know what I mean? Like, and and that's why these these two things dictate my work. Right. The, the movies are not any different from the compositions, which are not really that much different from the minimal, the, the, protocols, like the protocols of, you know, a lot of sculpture from that era. And so some, somehow I'm trying, 
I don't even, yeah, somehow I'm, I'm, I find myself working in between. And I say find myself because this is, it's like you wake up, you're like, where am I? You know, like with, when you make work, you're not really, or I don't know, at least with me, I'm not always in control of where I am. It just, I just follow my interests, you know? There's, I just wanted to ask about that because even in the show, there's the, the work upstairs, which maybe you could talk about the kind of the, the another gene, genealogical work about Kelly mm-hmm. Clarkson. And that, that seems to me like it's actually like quite a different logic in that, in that it's, uh, it's a kind of pseudo objective enterprise, which maybe you can explain, but it's right. also deep, very, it's much more idiosyncratic and. and yeah. Which work were you talking about? Please? Sorry. Since you've been gone, oh, yeah. Since you've been gone. Which is a. Um, it's a it's a it's a series of silk screens. It's silk screens on holographic metallic foil, and it's a genealogy kind of family tree of the song "Since You've Been Gone" by Kelly Clarkson. But it's a really good point. Um, that's like um, and so basically, I've picked CDs of musical influences that I think are embodied or have made possible the song Since You've Been Gone by Kelly Clarkson and um, also a few CDs that were influenced by that song. Um, but yeah, it's a really good point because that that concept is neat and clean, right? A collection of CDs. But in the middle, I'm able to kind of like let my hair down and, and be expressive, right? Yeah. It's like classic expression. It's kind of expressive, right? It's, yeah. Um, in what CDs I think contributed to that history. So the Bay City Rollers, like why did I put the Bay City Rollers in? Well, one I did because the Ramones were huge fans and the Ramones invented that guitar style. But two, you know, I put in the Bay City Rollers because it'd be great to have an artwork that had the Bay City Rollers in it. Do you know what I mean? Like there's also, you know, there's also culture, the, you know, the culture it has current currency or charisma, it's a charismatic, there's charisma in it, you know what I mean? And I wish I could do more of that, and I think some of the works upstairs do get into that. You know, like, why did I put lead in Uggs? I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, I just knew I wanted to make an artwork that had Uggs in it, that were, per, you know, and I, and, and, I, and I just thought, I wonder if you could order lead on Amazon.com, and it turns out you can. So it just, those I think are more, are, the, the way, th- those things are more expressive and more nonlinear and more um, abstract almost, you know, and it's exciting for me, like a, lunch, a bunch of the works upstairs are exciting because I'm, I'm learning to like let go a little bit, 